<laughs> okay, for the XU. No, for those of you that don't know, because some of you maybe not, you know, if, uh, if this is your first time knowing that we have a Russian church and a Russian pastor. I remember when my, when my wife and I first came uh, to Bethel many, many years ago, like the pastor said. Uh, some of you who have been here for a long time, you'll remember uh, Marina Abkazova uh, from Georgia. And uh, Mrs. Bickle had introduced, this is the Republic of Georgia, not the state of Georgia. And so my wife was talking with Marina, uh, and uh, Mrs. Bicklett introduced the two of them, and she said, uh, Marina's from Georgia. And Marina, when she talked with my wife, she said, after a while, she said, your English is really good. <laughs> There's a reason for that. Uh, you know, we were both born here. So the fact that I'm the Russian pastor, um, yeah, my, my knowledge of the English language is, is a, a tick better than my knowledge of the Russian uh, anyway. So... Uh, so that being said, uh, I'd ask you to take your Bibles with me and open them up to the book of Mark in the New Testament. And uh, because I don't want to, uh, to make things go uh, very long, uh, uh, typically when I, in a situation like this I would speak in English and also kind of uh, at the same time uh, do a translation. <coughs> I'm not planning to do the Russian translation today. Uh, so it'll just be basically an English uh, an English presentation. And it's going to have something in here that is a very important point, not specifically about baptism, but about understanding the Bible as a whole. And so it's, it's, it's going to be pretty relevant. Uh, Mark chapter 16. We just, of course, last week, we celebrated uh, the, the resurrection uh, of Jesus Christ from the dead. And so here we are a week later having, having a, a baptismal service. Not that uh, we always do it that way. Okay, right language, wrong volume. So now, now we should be in, in better shape. So, uh, in Mark chapter 16, what you have is at the beginning of the verse, at the beginning, beginning of the chapter, it's written, uh, When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome had brought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. Uh, of course, we're talking about uh, the dead and buried in the tomb body of Jesus Christ. Very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came into the sepulcher at the rising of the sun, and they had a problem. They said among themselves, who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? Right? Because the, the Jews didn't bury like we do by inserting the, a coffin into the ground and covering it up with soil. Uh, they use, you know, in our days we still use them, mausoleums or something where you actually have a little building, a little structure there at the cemetery, and then the, uh, the, the remains of the deceased are put inside of a, of a shelf or a drawer or something and, and, and stuck inside of it. Well, that's what's going on here. Uh, the Jews were using uh, a case, right? And so uh, when, the, when the body was, was, was uh, already placed inside the tomb, then they would take the stone, roll it in front of the door, and that was the door, right? So these ladies came, and they intended to honor the body of Christ. They intended to, to, uh, to uh, anoint uh, the body with various spices as a token of love and esteem. Uh, but they didn't know how they were going to get the door open. Who was going to roll the stone away? And so in verse number four, the story continues. When they looked they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. And here in verse 3 and verse 4, we have an interesting situation. Because you have these ladies who come with all sincerity, desiring to, to connect uh, with Christ, but they thought there was something in the way. They thought there was a problem that they couldn't overcome. And it turns out when they got there, the problem had already been solved. Now we, if we want to take and, 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 and turn it to, uh, uh, use a spiritual analogy to that, that's the same situation that every person on earth is born into. We're born, the Bible says, with a sinful nature that has us separated from God. God has His way, and we choose our way. And as a result, the two of us can't walk together. There's this divide. Uh, and of course, it comes about not just because of, of accident or we, we slip up, but people who know what God wants them to do refuse to do it. I don't want to do it that way. And so consequently, our sin is, uh, it, it just gets aggravated and aggravated. And so we have this separation between us and God, this sin that we are that, that, that we're consumed with. And how are we going to solve that problem? Well, the problem has been solved for us. And that is not by us trying to move the, the separator out of the way. It's because God has already reached out. And God has already rolled the stone out of the way. 
God has already given sinful people, like all of us are, access to himself. And that access is done through Jesus Christ, who, amongst his many other names given to him in the Bible, uh, at one place he calls himself the door. I am the door. The only way. Another time he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Uh, other, other verses we could use, right? Jesus said that there's a wide path that leads to destruction. Many use that path. A lot of different lanes, a lot of different uh, preferences. Maybe when you're driving, you like to hug the, the inside lane, right? The fast lane, for whatever reason. Maybe you prefer the slow lane. Maybe you like being right down the middle so, so uh, you can react to situation on both sides. Lots of different lanes all leading to the same place. And that's the situation with world religions. Lots of different variations, but they're all leading to the same place if they don't go through Jesus Christ the right way. So Jesus is the answer for mankind's sin. Now, moving on down here, they see that the stone is rolled away, and that's great. And uh, verse 5 says, Entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were frightened. And he saith unto them, Be not afraid. Ye see Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. But go your way, tell his disciples and Peter that he go before you into Galilee. There shall you see him as he said unto you. And they went out quickly and fled from the sepulchre. Okay, so that's what happens. Not only do they find the door open to the sepulchre, they find someone they didn't expect to find, which is this angel who's sitting there, to give the explanation for why they didn't find the person they were expecting to find. They were looking to find that dead, crucified body of Jesus. It wasn't there. Not because it had been moved, because he himself had moved it. He had come back to life. He had risen from the grave. He had overcome this separation, the problem of sin and the resulting problems of death and hell. Uh, those things, he had, he had solved those. So he, the angel gives them this notice that Christ is risen. They weren't going to find him there, but he did tell them where they would find him. They would find him in Galilee because that's what he had ahead of time, before his death, told his apostles, I'll, we'll meet again in Galilee. So they keep doing that, okay? Verse number, uh, verse number, and this chapter of Mark 16, it mentions that, uh, that Jesus appeared to various people, uh, and people were telling the apostles, I have seen the risen Lord. And the apostles, they don't believe it. And so in verse number 14, the Bible says, Afterward he appeared unto the eleven, as they sat at meat. Right? They're having their supper, they're having breakfast, they're having whatever, and Jesus appears unto them. And he upbraided them, or rebuked them, with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And so then uh, the Bible says, uh, skip a couple verses, after, at, then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Of course, we're having a baptismal service. And the center verse that I want to bring to your attention is verse 16, Mark 16, 16, where Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believes not shall be damned. Now, right from the get-go, let's establish something. And that is, water baptism is not, capital N, capital O, capital T, is not required or essential for salvation. It's not. Okay, so how then do we understand this verse in context with everything else the Bible has to say about the subject? And the answer is, anytime we approach the Bible, we need to not base our view, our opinion, our doctrine on just one place that appears in the Bible. We need to see how it fits inside the whole thing. Now, here it says, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. That's 100% true. Absolutely 100% true. Now, here's the big point that I said I was going to give you. It's not original, right? It's not something I came up with. When you read the Bible, we have to not just look at what it says. We have to also look at what it doesn't say. 
because here is one of those very popular places in the Bible where people jump to a conclusion that logically they should not jump to. What we're going to do is really quickly, we're going, to, we're going to scan maybe half a dozen other places in the Bible, not lengthy passages, mostly just a single verse at a time. The Bible, the, the message of the Bible clearly is that we are saved by faith. Water has nothing to do with it. Uh, taking communion has nothing to do with it. Being a member of a church, getting an attendance pin for perfect attendance for the next 50 years or whatever has nothing to do with it. The religious beliefs and do and even I'm speaking Dodger, uh, it's Russian, and even the the sincerity of your parents, your forebears, your grandparents, whoever has nothing to do with it. Every person, young or old, stands before God on their own. It is a decision that every person individually will make. Will make. Those people even who say, I don't want to talk about it, I don't want to think about it, uh, maybe some other time, they are making a decision when they push that decision off. Because if they refuse, for whatever reason, out of fear, out of whatever, if they refuse to choose Christ, they are simultaneously choosing not to have Christ. Right? It's that way. You can tell God, oh, I'll get to it. You can tell God, oh, you, 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 I will. When things slow down, when things are a little more, more stable, whatever. But the fact is, if you say that to yourself, if you say that in your heart, if you say that to God, verbally or just mentally, you are in effect saying to Him, not now. I don't want you now. I won't trust you now. Right now, I'm going to continue the way that I'm going. Maybe it's a difficult choice. Maybe it's tearing me up inside. But until you say yes, you are saying no. That's how it works. That's how it works at McDonald's. That's how it works at Target or Walmart. That's how it works anytime you have to make a decision. You pick one, and by picking one, you leave the others on the shelf. You walk out with one. You can use one, a new game, a new radio, a new a new sweater, whatever. The other ones are left there. They're not yours. You don't have them. You don't possess them. You can't use them. They are no good to you whatsoever. When we talk about being saved, it's a matter of faith. It's a matter of trust. It's a matter of depending upon Christ. You either have you have it. Now, what is this? Let's talk about this Mark 16 16 here uh, again, uh, quickly. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. True. We could also say, He that believeth and is baptized and goes to church and prays three times a day and reads the Bible and memorizes the to a whole slew of Bible verses and is kind to of their neighbor and forgives people when they do wrong against them, etc., 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 will be saved. That would also be true, right? What the Bible does not say here, and here's where you got to focus in, the Bible does not say that he that is not baptized will be damned or will not be saved. It doesn't say that. It says if you believe and are baptized, you will be saved. If you don't believe, you won't be saved. It doesn't even address what happens if you believe and are not baptized. It doesn't say you won't be saved. And it doesn't say if you just don't believe at all and, and don't get baptized, you won't be saved either. The key point throughout the entire Bible is salvation by faith. Now, let's hit a few verses in the next book, the book, I'm sorry, not the next book, the Gospel of John, a couple verses over, and I'll just read these. Don't need to comment on them. But listen to what the Bible says. Listen to what Jesus says. John chapter 3, verse number 16. That's where, that's where we're going to start at. He says this, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Whosoever believeth will not perish. No additions made for believeth and is baptized, believeth and is faithful, believeth and walks the straight and narrow after that. It's not there. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Again, this is a worldwide thing. Only one way. Next verse. 
He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. There's your, there's your dichotomy. There's the clear declarity. Believe and be saved. Don't believe and don't be saved. That's as simple as it gets. That's John chapter 3. A couple places here. Verse 16, verse 17, verse number 18. Same chapter, verse 36, ends like this. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. One condition. John, chapter number 5, something similar. Verse number 24, Jesus says, Verily, verily, truly, truly, I say unto you, He that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Right? Not will be, not, you got a good chance, is passed. It is a done deal, a finished transaction based upon believing on Christ. Another one, John chapter 8, I'll read that one to you, where the Bible says, Jesus said, uh, I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins, he was talking to Pharisees, for if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Again, the focus is very clear. It's not a person's relationship to the church or to the community as a whole. It's not the amount of honor that they receive from various forms that, that, that make the difference. Salvation is dependent upon one thing, and that is our relationship to Jesus Christ, God's only begotten Son, the one that He sent, the one who became a man, the one who died for our sins and was buried and rose again and then ascended into heaven is right now seated at the right hand of God and is waiting for God to give him the signal to come back and establish his eternal kingdom on this earth. And so this is the reality that every person here throughout the world has to deal with sooner or later. You know, we can put Christ off for a while if we want to but the day is coming when there will be no putting it off because now he gives an opportunity now he extends a call but when the time comes for him to come then game's over it's up the choice that has been made already is the choice that's locked in you know sometimes people have that idea that well, you know, I'm going to live here, I'm going to, I'm going to do what I want to do, I'm going to die. Yeah, and then I'm going to suffer a little while, and then I'm going to get all cleaned up, and then God's going to let me out of hell, and I'm going to be able to enjoy the rest of eternity in heaven. Except that's not what the Bible teaches. And the Bible teaches that the decision that we make when our life here is over is the decision that we will have to live with for all of eternity. There is no second chance after death. And there will be no no last minute salvation when Christ comes. But uh oh. It's one of those events that once it begins to unfold, it it's already too late. When you like somebody who gets a disease, right? And they say, Well if you get these symptoms or maybe a snake bite, right? You get a you get a vicious a poisonous snake bite. If this and this and this happens, you're already gone. Forget about it. Same kind of thing. When Christ returns, it's already done. It's already done. It's already over with. So you have to prepare ahead of time by faith. Because if you wait until it's obvious, if you wait until he splits the skies open and you see him coming back, it's too late. It's too late. Last place that we'll take a look at here, the book of Acts, chapter number 16. The Apostle Paul, who himself was a violent uh, opponent of Christ and Christianity, violent to the point of you know, seeking after Christians, throwing them in jail, voting against them to put to death, that kind of thing. He himself was changed. He himself was saved. And in Acts chapter 16, you have a situation here where he gets thrown in jail. 
How do you like that? He gets thrown in jail because he was preaching, because he was telling the truth. As a result, um, he gets locked up in jail, thrown in irons, and uh, at midnight, the Bible says, he and his associate, they begin to pray and praise the Lord, pray and sing. Well, God sends an earthquake, blows the place open. The jailer comes out, sees all the doors flung open. He thinks it's, he thinks he's, it's over. They're, 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 they, they've flown the coop. They're gone. Consequently, in the Roman world, you lost a prisoner, you lost your neck. It was that simple. You know, no ifs, ands, buts, no extenuating circumstances. You lose one, you're gone. And so consequently, we have the keeper here in verse 27. He awakes out of his sleep. He sees the prison doors are open. He draws out his sword, and he would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But they were all still there. Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light, that is the jailer. He sprang in, he came trembling, he fell down before Paul and Silas, brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And thy house, that is, you don't get to choose for your, for your kids and your, or your relatives, it means the same thing applies to your house as well. It's all, it's all the same. And so, we could spend more time going through the Bible, uh, all through the Bible. You have a situation, while we're on the baptism subject, which is the main thing here, you know, there are also those people who teach that a person has to be baptized in their youth, like very young, that the parents can make this decision for the children and that it has some kind of positive effect. You know, it, it, it makes their reservation in heaven, so to speak, something like that. The kid can always opt out of it later on, you know, if he, if he strays from the right path, but, but it's covered at the beginning. You know, the connection is made between this baptism of children, infant baptism, and circumcision in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, God said that the Jews had to circumcise their baby boys when they were eight days old. Eight days old. Separate term. But Abraham, the Bible talks about him, of course, in the book of Genesis and various other places. In the book of Romans, it talks about, well, well, when was Abraham saved? And the Bible says that Abraham was declared righteous when he was still uncircumcised. Circumcision is a totally different thing from baptism. It's a totally different thing. So... Obviously, in our case, working with a lot of uh, people who have come from a Russian Orthodox background, they practice infant baptism. Uh, it's something that we deal with on a regular basis. Uh, so in any case, the point that I want to draw this all toward is this, and that is that as we look at what Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. The, 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 the baptism part is true, but you have to look at what, he, what the Bible doesn't say, right? The absence of baptism. Nowhere does the Bible say the absence of baptism is from the person. And so we try to make this very clear as we counsel with people who are uh, interested in following the Lord because if we are trusting in baptism as our way of salvation, as our sin cleanser, then we can't be trusting completely in the shed blood of Christ. It's one of those things that are mutually exclusive, right? You can't do both. Either you're trusting in Jesus Christ alone, His sacrifice on the cross, or you try to add something on the, on the side. My good works, my, my family connections, my family history, my religiousness, my, my sincerity, and there's a place for all that stuff. Right? But it doesn't have any place at all in that transaction that a perishing sinner makes with the only Savior, the one and only Savior, Jesus Christ. And so, if you have any additional questions, I mean, we're going to be having a series of four baptisms today, and you'll be hearing their testimonies. Some of the folks, uh, each one is going to need to be saying uh, uh, on, on, on the fly uh, what they have prepared to say, or maybe they even be reading something they've, they've already prepared. Uh, so you'll hear some of these things repeated over and over again. Uh, my, my goal this morning, this afternoon, was to 
particularly hit this one place that a lot of people look at and they try to give the wrong, the wrong impression of what it means. Uh, we've had people say, say to us, oh, you're Baptist, right? Right. Well, that means you want, every, you want everybody to be baptized, right? Uh, hang on there. Why do we want everybody to be baptized? Yes, we do, but not for the reason that you think. We do because baptism is a sign. It is a public testimony that someone has trusted in Christ alone as their Savior. And in obedience to what Christ says, they want to announce it to all the world. Baptism itself is a, is a word, not a word picture, it's, a, it's an object lesson. Just like Christ was crucified on the cross and died and then was buried and then rose again from the dead, the people who follow the Lord in baptism aren't doing it to be saved, but because they already have been saved by trusting in Jesus. And now consequently, they're identifying with Him and they're publicly showing to everyone here uh, that they have chosen to do that. So if you have any additional questions about baptism, certainly uh, ask Pastor, ask myself, uh, there are other people here as well, our deacons and whatnot, uh, that you can ask uh, about what it means. And uh, I would encourage you also, those of you, I mean, a lot of you I don't know, uh, examine your own self. On what are you trusting to remove the sin barrier between you and God? If it's biblical, you're in good shape. If it's quasi-biblical, kind of biblical, has a little Bible sprinkled in it, then you're in bad shape. And so, uh, let's pray, and then they will come to say, Lord, we thank you for the day. We thank you for these who have declared their faith in Christ. We thank you, most of all, for making a way of salvation available to us sinners. And we pray that you'll direct the rest of our service in Jesus' name. Amen.